Last week, we gave an introduction to the concept of demons explained by a science-minded person, so that everyone, especially those with a more dominant left brain like skeptics and scientists and atheists, can understand them and even feel them without the need of faith. Our approach was mostly, but not only, through the psychological aspect. We talked about what they are, how they work, why they show up, which parts of ourselves they attach to, and even what is an exorcism. I know these words can be really triggering for some of you who have a classic view of demons. If you're new to this channel, I have two things to say. One is that I always approach anything related to spirituality and healing in a grounded way so that everyone, including skeptics, can relate. And second, if you didn't watch the first part of this video, I would ask you to go and do that first or else you will be missing very important context for this video. You can click here in the corner or down in the description below. Trust me, go watch that first and then come back here. And because we have a lot more to cover, let's get right into it. Hi there, I'm Ivan with a decade of experience facilitating healing ceremonies. All right, so let's do a really quick recap just to refresh your memory. Last week, we talked about the following things. What demons are, which is a force that makes us act in ways that go against our own well-being. How they work and why they show up, which is to fill in the empty space left in our emotional body so that we can get the closest similar thing to our unmet need, which we will seek indefinitely. Which part of ourselves they attach to? To our wounds, which is like their home. What is an exorcism? Which is expelling that force by removing their home. And we do that simply by doing healing and filling in the space that they are taking with the real need. And we also talked about how similar is the relationship between our wounds and demons analog to the earth and gravity. Okay, so now with our memory refreshed, let's talk about what we are going to be covering today. First, I will start with a story that completely changed my perspective of them. Two, through this story, we will learn the spiritual approach to them and how that relates to science. Three, why it matters to talk about them as demons and not as something else. Four, which types of them are out there. And five, a complete new way to look at them as the cause and not the effect. Are you ready? I would like to start by telling you a story. The one that made me finally become open-minded to exploring this topic, going from extreme skepticism, cringing every single time I would hear this word, to finally wanting to explore this topic with real interest and curiosity. This is the story that made that happen. So one day, a very special participant arrived to a ceremony. Let's call him K. Back then, I didn't believe in demons at all, and I couldn't bear the fact that healing work was approached from that angle in so many circles. So K said that he came to ceremony because he had a lot of demons attached to him and he wanted to remove them. Oh, great. That's what I thought. I wasn't necessarily judgmental of him or of anybody who saw the world like that, but I always approached healing from the psychological point of view and that always created such amazing results. People always liked that my healing spaces were grounded in science without dismissing the spiritual aspect of it. Until this guy, which I thought I could simply talk to him using psychology and that would create the healing that he needed. Throughout the experience, he kept calling me over and over again, saying that the medicine was bringing up the demons to the surface, but that they were not leaving. So I thought, all right, well, maybe if I give him more medicine, he's going to feel that his demons are leaving, whatever that truly means for him. But more medicine meant that his demons were more on the surface. He was more in touch with them. They were closer to his awareness and they were more present. But he didn't feel that he was making any progress with it. And to be honest, I really felt for him. I did not know what that felt like, but it seemed like he truly felt and believed that he had demons attached to him. And in this case, not the demons that I was talking about throughout the past video, but the ones that show up in people's minds when you say that word, a more classic demon. I really wanted to help him, but I didn't know how, because for two days, I kept using all the knowledge that I have on psychology and the tools that I learned in ceremony, but he was making no progress at all. No inner child work, no understanding where his unmet needs were, no digging deep into his childhood wounds would help in any way. It was the first time where none of the things that I've learned worked. And I felt a sense of responsibility that if he puts his trust in me to heal, then I have to do everything that's in my power to figure it out. As I was many times tempted to say, I'm sorry, I just can't help you. But something in me couldn't say it. And for many of you, the solution might be pretty obvious. But for me back then, it wasn't. 
the inner effort that it took me to finally decide to approach his demons as actual demons was massive. It is like asking an atheist to take advice from an astrologer and to take it genuinely. How can that happen? How could I approach someone's healing by talking about demons and angels and do it genuinely? Well, here's how. I couldn't. So I faked it. And it worked. Okay, so here's how. I thought it doesn't really matter if demons are real or not. They are real to him. That's his experience. I have been not been able to help him because I was not meeting him where he was at. Instead, I was asking him to meet me where I am at. But who is the one asking for healing? And thus, who should meet who where they are at? Based on the idea that he is experiencing it as such, I decided to go for it. And once I made the decision, I truly, truly, truly went for it. I told myself to believe in demons for as long as we were processing. And that once the process was over, I could change my belief back to the way it was. I could, at the very least, believe in his experience, because the demons could have or could have not been real, but his experience of them was. So I talked to him by talking to his experience, and using all my effort to not feel that I was being completely ridiculous or insane, I said, I am not talking to Kay anymore. I am talking to the demon in him. Please come out. I want to talk to you. What happened afterwards was like a horror movie. His face contracted, one eye got shut, he was showing his teeth, he was like... I swear, it was freaking creepy. And then he said... I am here! Uh, I won't lie, I kind of got scared. But I also thought, um, okay, we're in this. So I started improvising our conversation. <laughs> I couldn't believe that life has taken me to the point where I was honestly having a conversation with a demon and that I was completely following along. A part of me managed to stay in it because it felt like it was the only thing that was actually working. And then another part of me felt like I could simply take it as if I would be playing. So I asked the demon what did he want and the demon said that it was a she. So I asked her what did she want, why was she in that body, and what did she need in order to leave that body? And a thousand other questions. She seemed to be answering honestly. And I have to say, even though that was one of the craziest conversations I ever had, it also felt very powerful and meaningful. If you would want the full conversation, I might create at some point a little PDF with the details of it. But in short, what it felt like is that I was playing some sort of chess with the demon. When the demon would say something like, I'm in this body because I need vital energy to survive, I would say something like, but this body has no more vital energy, you sucked it all up, you are killing your energy source. You are using your body to replace your real need. What do you really need? At the end, the typical process that I do, asking which needs went unmet, and childhood trauma, and all that kind of stuff that I always do with a person, I did it with the demon. The demon was my healing target, not the person. And after talking with the demon for about 30 minutes, I got to perfectly understand what happened to Kay as a child and which ones were his unmet needs. Basically, the demon gave it all away. And that was the first time when I noticed that the demon was attached to Kay's deepest wounds. I felt those wounds were like empty spaces where the demon could thrive and live in. So for the first time in my life, I thought, if we can give Kay whatever was originally in that space, maybe the demon will not be able to stay there anymore. So I said, Kay, are you there? I'm talking to you now. And his face went back from really creepy to normal and he said, yes. So then I started my usual process with him, making him reconnect with the pain of the love that he didn't receive as a child and also making him feel seen in that experience, both by me and by himself. I held him in the way in which he was not held and then I also asked him to notice how I was holding him so that he could imitate it and do it for himself. And so he did. He started giving to himself the love that he needed exactly in the way that he needed it, using the process that I talk about in my video about self-validation that you can check out here in the corner or down in the description below. And then the miracle started happening. First he started convulsing. Then his face went from his normal face to the demon face to the normal face to the demon face, kind of like this. <laughs> and 
and then the demon started yelling and escaping his body. And as that was happening, Kay started finally smiling and laughing for the first time in the ceremony. And then a little bit more yelling by the demon, and then a little bit more laughing and smiling, and then more yelling, and then more laughing and smiling, and that went on and on for about an hour. I swear it was like in the movies, it was really crazy. But at the end, he calmed down, completely drenched in sweat, but with the lightest gaze that I've seen in him and probably in my whole life. Something in him was free. He looked at me, he smiled, he gave me a hug, and then started crying, yelling, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that thank you wasn't directed at me, but it was an expression of the gratitude experienced after the liberation that he was experiencing in that moment. It has been years since then, but when I catch up with him, he tells me that he has felt free ever since, and that he finally could start living his life. So, what have I learned from this experience? First, I can't know for sure whether demons are real in the ways in which people normally think of them or not, but they exist in some way. I am not sure in which one. Even if it is simply in people's minds, that is still one form of existence. Emotions wouldn't exist without people experiencing them, so we could say that emotions aren't really real, but they are real within each person. And demons can be exactly that, they might not exist without people, but they can still be experienced and be real within each person. Second, it is important to be able to speak the language of demons and angels, even if it is not the natural way in which you speak, like it was in my case, so that you have bigger chances of meeting people where they are at. In order to speak it, you must understand it as best as possible. These two last episodes on demons are my best attempt at that. Third, I realized that for some people, some wounds can only be addressed if they are approached through the spiritual perspective. And trust me, I've tried doing it only from the scientific side. It didn't work. And at the same time, it was so easy from the spiritual side. It flowed so much better. So by speaking both languages, you're opening yourself up to going through where things flow easier. Science and spirit are simply worldviews, ways in which we experience the world. In a way, they are like languages that we use to communicate. Speaking both languages can help a lot by using the one that the other person is fluent in. If you go to Japan, things will flow much easier for you if you speak Japanese. Some people will understand English really well, some not so much, and some will not speak it at all. Wouldn't you want to speak fluent Japanese if you could before going to Japan? Well, the same happens here. If you want to help yourself and others heal, the better you speak both languages, the more that people will understand you and relate to you, and the more that you will understand them and relate to them too. Fourth, I learned the tight relationship between demons and trauma as explained in the first episode of this series. This has given me a lot of freedom on how to approach people's healing, sometimes approaching it only from the side of demons, sometimes using only psychology, and sometimes using a combination of both depending on the situation and the person that I was assisting. By doing that, I also learned how to approach my own healing using a combination of both worldviews too. I can now see when it feels like what I'm dealing with is with a demon. After that, I can talk to it, I can relate to it, I can understand where it is attaching to and then do self-healing in the places where the demon is helping me discover. Because if there is a demon, there is a wound. Fifth. Since then, I've been using the language of demons much more freely, and it has helped my practice tremendously. I even did many exorcisms ever since. Never like in the movies, forcing the demon out, using some sort of magic, and yelling while holding a cross. Always by filling up the emotional space in which the demon is attached to, by understanding which need has gone unmet. A perfect blend of psychology and spirituality. So, at this point, I am a believer in things that we cannot see much more than what I am disclosing. However, having hundreds of ceremonies under my belt, I am aware that the kind of perspectives that I was exposed to can only happen after having have done that much exploration with psychedelics, and that most people simply have not done that. So, I am disclosing as much as I feel safe to not look or sound like someone that you are not going to be able to relate to. Throughout this YouTube journey, I am sure that I will eventually share a lot more of the beautiful perspectives that I have been exposed to. So, we have two more things to cover. 
First, which kind of demons are out there? Well, plenty, but let's take a look at a few examples. The anger demon. This is a force that makes you act against your own well-being when the anger that you are experiencing is stronger than your capacity to hold it. It might make you punch someone or the wall or say horrible things that you don't really mean or become passive aggressive. Or if the intensity of the anger is way beyond what you can handle, it might blind you temporarily and make you do really crazy things, destroy everything or even kill. This force lives in the wound caused by the pain that brought up the anger. The negative thoughts demon. This force lives in the wound caused by the traumatic experience that gives rise to this negative self-talk. For example, your parents telling you that you are good for nothing when you were a kid. That creates a wound in which the thought, I am good for nothing, lives. You can't control that thought. It is a force pulling you in that direction. It is against your own well-being and that's why I call it a demon. The money demon. This force lives within all your wounds related to money. These are all deep and complex wounds. Money wounds are related to survival, self-worth, belief of what one deserves, a sense of belonging, and so, so, so many other wounds. It actually requires a video of its own. Now, this force can make you act in many different ways, of course, all against yourself. It can make you greedy. It can make you feel that you will not be able to make it, even if everything points in the opposite direction. It can make you give everything that you have away because you don't believe you deserve it. It can make you choose someone based on their net worth instead of on what you really need, etc, etc. And the last example is the Jesus demon. The first thing I need to clarify is that I am not saying that Jesus is a demon. Please keep watching, I am not insulting anyone's faith. The Jesus demon is just a label for it. It is not related to Jesus at all and it works like any other demon. I labeled it like that because this demon uses the parts of people's wounds that became obsessed with Jesus. Anyone that becomes obsessed with anything, whatever that thing is, has a part of them that it is wounded that is creating that obsession. Basically, without the wound, there would be no obsession. And that is the difference between people who simply believe in Jesus and those who are obsessed with him. The obsessed part is wounded based. That applies to obsession with Jesus as much as obsession with anything else. So what does the Jesus demon do and how does it act? Well, demons, besides being a force that makes us act in ways that go against our own well-being, also create specific consequences. One of them is to disconnect us from ourselves and from others. I have an acquaintance that every single thing he says needs to include the word Jesus or God in it. How are you? I'm okay, thanks to the grace of God. Have a nice day! I am having a nice day because Jesus loves me. Hey, do you want ketchup or mustard for your burger? Hmm, let me think. What would Jesus put in his burger? So what are the consequences of that? First, lack of relatability. Second, disconnection from most people. And third, pushing anyone who does not live with that same kind of obsession away from him. It makes most people not even want to engage in conversation even for people who are religious, believe in Jesus or in God. Why is that? Because he is not talking in the name of Jesus. The demon is attached to a wound within himself that uses Jesus as a way of disconnecting him from others and from himself. We can also call it the demon of disconnection and is having a feast creating disconnection using Jesus as an excuse for it based on a wound that created that obsession. This demon makes this person not feel the pain that this whole Jesus thing is numbing or soothing. There are hundreds of types, and they are all doing the same thing, making you do things that go against yourself that you wouldn't do if you would not have that force pulling you in that direction. And they all live in the same place, which is within the wounds that you have yet to heal. And to conclude, I would like to give one more perspective on demons. Now, this one I did not come up with by myself. It was a good friend of mine who introduced me to this idea. The first time I heard it, I said, no, it cannot be that way. With time, this perspective grew on me. I am not sure about it. I honestly don't think we really can be. But the more I explore these concepts, the more I feel how small we are, how little we know, and how pretty much anything could be possible, especially about the mechanics of how the universe works and how it is constructed. My friend's perspective is that it is not that wounds come first 
and then demons come in to fill in that space. But that it could also be that the demons are the force that cause the wounds. Basically, that these forces are out there at all times, making us act in ways that will cause wounds to each other. For example, that a car crash happened because a person got distracted just at the right moment, even though this person was paying attention and has a perfect driving history. My friend would say that what caused the accident was a force pulling this person's attention in the direction that will maximize the chances of a car crash. It is the demon of distraction. Does it feel too much out there? That's okay, it felt like that to me too. And there's still a big part of me that feels that way. But there is also another part of me that considers it as a possibility. Why not? As always, I tend to land somewhere outside of the world of duality. It might not be one or the other, it might be both at the same time. You can check my video on science and spirituality where I discuss exactly that topic up here or in the description below, where I discuss how to blend science and spirituality as best as possible. If we go back to the example we talked about last week on Earth and gravity, I said that Earth comes first and then gravity. Without Earth or any object containing mass, there would be no gravity. Earth is the visible part and gravity is the force. I compared it to wounds and demons, saying the wound is the visible part and the demon is the force. Like with earth and gravity, the wound comes first, the demon comes later. There can't be a demon without a wound, as there cannot be gravity without the earth. But is this really true? Even if there would be no mass in the universe, wouldn't the law of gravity still exist as part of the rules of this reality, so that if suddenly a massive object appears, it will already be subject to the law of gravity? Could gravity be there as a law independent of whether there is mass or not? If you're thinking yes, gravity is always there independent of whether there is mass or not, then if we apply this to demons, then my whole theory goes out the window. Because demons then will always be there independent of wounds. It is true that without wounds, demons then would have nowhere to apply their force in the same way that without mass, gravity would have nowhere to apply its force. But they would still be there dormant, waiting for a wound to form, waiting for an empty emotional space to appear so that they can go and fill it in, filling the void inside of us. To me, it is both at the same time, Gravity would not exist without mass, but mass will always be subjected to gravity. Demons can't exist without wounds, but wounds are always be subjected to demons. So I would like to ask you, which one is it for you? Wow, what a journey. I really enjoyed exploring this. I hope that you enjoyed it too. I also hope that this has helped spark a new way of looking at this topic, new thoughts, a little bit of curiosity, and made you ponder about the wonders of the world that we live in and of the amazing universe that it is you. Hey, I'm recording this after the video was already finished, but I wanted to give you a little gift. It is a summary of everything that you just watched, nicely put together in a beautiful PDF, so that you can take a look at it anytime that you need to refresh your memory. This will give you access to the PDF of this and all my other videos. The link is in the description below. If you didn't like the video yet unsubscribed to the channel, that helps channels in initial stages like mine grow. So I would appreciate that a lot. And I'll see you in next week's video. Click on the left square to watch another video I made on a related topic. All my content is free. If you appreciate it and wish to assist me to continue releasing this kind of content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can also follow me on my socials and subscribe to this channel.